It's simple because um, I'm not certain like some of the audience are teachers and uh, some are obviously uh, working at home with their children and so forth. And I have a lot of empathy for that because um, uh, my son and uh, daughter-in-law have a five-year-old at home at the moment, a three-year-old and one on the way. So uh, she's tearing her hair out with the five-year-old in terms of homeschooling and so forth. So I thought we'd start with some uh, simple stuff earlier and then uh, just build and show some uh, different ways that we might uh, expand or make some of the games a little bit more difficult. So I thought I'd start with a really basic idea. And what we're going to do is uh, switch over from the picture of my face to uh, we're going to do some things uh, on a screen that you can see and we'll take an example or two. And uh, as I said, we're going to record this as well. So if you miss anything, uh, you have the opportunity to have another look at it later. So we're just going to switch onto a different screen at the moment and you can have a look at that. So you might notice on the screen, I've just put some cards. Now, you don't need to use these cards. You could use any pack of cards that's laying around your house, but we just happen to be using these ones. Now, obviously in terms of this, uh, we're gonna talk about a couple of really basic games that you can play, and then I'll talk about ways to make it more difficult. So a game that most people might be aware of, I guess it depends on your country to a certain extent, uh, but uh, we would know it as Snap. Now in the standard version of Snap, if you lay a card down, for example, here we'll lay the nine down. Uh, obviously you wouldn't see it, your cards would be uh, face up like that or face down like that. If someone play, did a nine and then uh, someone else turns their card over and it happens to be a nine, in that case we would snap. Some people use uh, in Australia fly swatter, they call it uh, swat, but the same sort of thing. Now that's a pretty stock standard game and it's a nice easy one and for young children, it's really neat because you've got the notion of matching. But then we can take the same game idea and all we're gonna do is build on that same sort of thing. So we often play a game called snap one more or one less, in which case, instead of a nine going, if a nine was down, you would snap if an eight went down because it's one less, or you would snap if a 10 went down because it was one more. So in other words, you take the same idea of snap. So just imagine this happens. So out, come, out from the pack comes uh, this one, it's turned over, it's a nine, and then the next player turns over their card and it's an eight, then you'd get a snap because it's one less in this case. Likewise, if the player turned over this card and it turned out to be a 10, it'd be one more and you could snap on that. So I just call that snap one more and one less. Just the stock standard snap game, but you just make a little alteration to it. So we'll just talk about that same general idea because it may be that you've got uh, two children at home, one's a little bit older than the other. And so um, we're looking for things where they can develop a few social skills, I guess. And sometimes the older one's just gonna to have to uh, deal with some of the simpler ideas. But now, let me show you how you can make the same game much uh, a bit more difficult. So let's take the same idea now. And in this case here, uh, we might play a different game and the snap is no longer, um, one more, one less. So if a nine goes down, we're going to call it snap 10. So for example, if the number one goes down, then you can snap on that one because nine and one is 10. So all we're really doing is taking that same general idea and looking at variations of that. For example, let me give you another one. So let's say the two goes down next. Well, if an eight went down, then I could snap and I win the whole pile of cards that are there. So that's just taking the same general game called snap and all we've done is change the rules slightly. And there's other variations that you could try. Let me pick up another game, which is a, a simple idea. It's a, an oral language game. Uh, I would call it fish. Uh, and essentially it works in, in a certain way. Um, if you have two or three players, uh, they would have five cards each. Now when you dealt the five cards, and I'll show you what I mean in a minute, you ask questions in order to get a card from your opponent. So I'll just put five cards down and you can have a look at the, the cards that we have here. And as I said, any pack of cards will do. So I don't have to get too carried away here. So we've got five cards. Imagine that's in my hand. And essentially there, um, what I need to do is get pairs. So I need to either get another three or a nine or a two or an eight or a one. So I have to ask a question and uh, we always encourage some manners. So you say, uh, do you have a two to the, your opponent? If the player has a two, then they have to give up their two. They would pass their two to you and you take the both of them out of your hand 
and you put them on the table so everyone can see. And because uh, you are able to do that, you get to ask again. And I might ask in this case, have you got an eight? Now, if the other player doesn't have an eight, they would say to you, go fish. Now, go fish means you go to the pack of cards that might be laying face down there and you have to fish or take a card off that pack and put it in your hand. Okay, now, that's the base version of the game. And simply all you're doing is asking for a number. And so it would be for very young children, you'd be recognising numbers and you'd be saying, have you got a whatever it might be. Now, let's make that same game. Let's make it a little bit more difficult. So one way to make it more difficult is, let's say I wanted the card that was two, but I'm not allowed to use the word two. So now the child has to work out another way to ask for two without saying the word two. So they might say, oh, um, I'm after the card that is one less than three. Or they might uh, say, uh, if I was a bit older, I'm after the card that is half of four. Or I'm after the card that is 10% of 20. They're all different ways of asking for a two. So what you're really doing is taking the same basic game and then you are changing the nature of the game by the language or the mathematical vocabulary that you are using. Now, I would refer to that as basically the literacy overlay that you are putting on top of whatever the game is. So what, if you think about it, a lot of mathematics is not just about mathematics. There's also a literacy element of it. And uh, we spend a lot of time on doing that. So that's just two basic card games. There's obviously plenty more that you could play, but I just thought we'd spend time on, on a couple of those. Uh, what I'd like to do is move on to a couple of different games. And we're basically going to take uh, one idea and we appreciate that at home, you probably don't have all the equipment that you might have at a school. So I want to just illustrate a couple of things that you might substitute if you don't have all the gear. So let's take a pretty basic game. I'll put it up on so you can see it. And look, you're welcome uh, to download this game. In fact, once I teach you this game, there are 24 similar ones just sitting on my website that you're welcome to download just in the A4 game section. Now, look, if I was in a school, I'd just use you know, a plastic spinner and sit it on the top and we would have a spinner. But we don't have that luxury if we're working at home. So the simple way to do this is to grab a paper clip, doesn't matter what size you've got, and basically we're going to make a really simple spinner because all I do is put my pen point in there and I spin the paper clip and that one's landed on nine. And so in this case, I've made the spinner. Now, for your benefit, because you may not have dice as well at home, we've put a couple of different spinner templates up that you're welcome to download. Now, what I'll do is I'll just take you through the basic idea of this game, which is really about things that add to 10. And I'll show you how to make it a bit simpler if, if the children are a bit younger, just learning about it, and how to make it a bit harder if the children are a little bit older. So basically, the same game can be used with a couple of different children at home. Now, uh, ideally, it would be nice if we had some counters, and I'll show you how we'll play this, but we can substitute buttons if you want to. So let's just have a bit of a look. And so I have some counters on there, and normally I have two different colours of see-through counters. But if you don't have that, we could do buttons. Okay, so I've just collected some buttons that we've got laying around the house. They would do the same thing. Now, essentially, in this game, what happens is it's called Build 2, and we're going to play a game called Build to 10. So in this case here, if I spin, now you notice that I did a spin and it went on nine. So I place my counter on the number that builds it to 10. So I'm going to go for this one here because nine and one is 10. Then it's uh, the next player's turn, so they get to spin. And oh, this one got choose a spot. Let's move and let's, let's spin another time. So we've got eight. Choose a spot is good, but we, uh, we'll leave it till a little bit later. So we just spun an eight and I'm the second player. So eight and two builds to 10 and I'm looking for two. Now, the aim of this game is to get three counters in a row or a column. So rows always go across, columns always go down or a diagonal. Now, I'm looking to see whether I can block this red player, but it doesn't look like it's too easy to do. So I'm gonna put my counter on two here because eight and two is 10. Now, I could easily, just as easily have used buttons to do the same thing. Uh, you're welcome to print the, the sheet out and so forth. 
buttons will do the same. And all we want to do is get three numbers in a row, column or diagonal. Now, let's say that uh, some children are struggling with the things that add to 10. Well, we can use a couple of options here. One, we, the tool that I would use in a school, and I'll just show you here, the tool that I would use in a school is a thing called a TENS frame. Now, you probably don't have a TENS frame at home. Where we can put one up, but you could easily make one just out of an egg carton. Uh, an egg carton's got 12 things on it, just cut the two ends off it. But essentially with a TENS frame, what you do is you start to put some counters into that TENS frame. Notice I'm filling the top deck of what I'm gonna call the double decker bus at the moment. And let's imagine that I had just on the spin that I just did, and that spin was eight. So I put eight counters in there because for young kids, they, uh, they won't be able to uh, that's work out that eight and two is 10. So they need to physically do it with the materials. So we've got eight and for some of them, they can see that it's two more, takes me to 10. But for other children, they'll need to put two different colors in. Once again, I could use the buttons. If that was a substitute I had. And you can see that eight and two is 10. Now the fancy name for that in uh, teacher speak is basically part, part, whole. The whole is 10, one part of it's seven, and the other parts too. And that's a fairly important concept for young children to learn. Now what I'd like to do is take us to the next level. So in other words, you could have this to make the game a bit simpler. And I'll just take this out of the way. I'll bring the game back. So in this case here, you could take that game, uh, but we can make it harder. So if you've got some older uh, children at home, they could play exactly the same game. But what we're going to do this time is uh, go to any different decade. So in other words, we're just playing build to 10, but we could easily be playing build to 100. And I'll show you how you make a little modification and that'll take you into a thing called build to 100. So I'm just gonna write over this sheet. So if you have a look now, you'll see what I write on it and how it will work. So in this case here, we're now gonna call it build to 100. And in the slots here that I've got on the spinner, that becomes 97, 91, 96, oh, it should be 98, sorry about that. 93, 99, 94, 92, and 95. And now, if I spin up 95, in this case here, what number builds 95 to 100? Well, then I put my counter on the five, because 95 and another five is 100. We could make build to 50, build to 30, build to 40. I just wanted to sort of give you ways in which you could play the same game with maybe a couple of different children at home and each are getting something at their level. But once you understand the base game. Now, just for your benefit, this is basically, it's a bingo style game. So we spin something, we put a counter or a, you know, a, 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 one of our buttons that we've got at home on the, on the thing, on the cell, and then away we go. Now, if you were teaching time, for example, so in Australia, um, Young children, year one, would learn to tell the time to the hour and half hour in year one. In year two, it's the quarter hour, and in year three, to the minute. So we have some similar games that are called time match to the hour, time match to the half hour, time match to the quarter hour, and so you can start to uh, try and match the level of the game to the student that's playing. So they all work on exactly the same idea, and once you understand how the spinner works, that's uh, relatively easy to do. So I thought we'd look at a couple of other things that we could do. Um, sometimes we want to practice um, things in a puzzle. And I quite like a particular sort of puzzle, uh, but there's quite a few on, on um, that you can get on the web. We put a little booklet up that will help you get started. But we like a thing called a Ken Ken. So I'd just like to take you through how Ken Ken works. Um, if you've ever done something like a Sudoku puzzle before, Ken Ken is very similar, uh, but with numbers. And um, you can get, we've got a little four by four Ken Ken here, but if you go online, uh, you can get a three by three Ken Ken, and that just uses the numbers one, two, and three. You can go as far as a nine by nine Ken Ken, and that will use the numbers one to nine, but you can also have multiplication and division. So once you've taught this general idea of a Ken Ken, um, you can change the level depending on where you are how old your children are. I'd always start with something simple though. So we're gonna start with this one and you can find this one's up on the web, but you can go online and you can find there's, uh, in Australia, there's Ken Ken Australia. There's all sorts of uh, material on the web to help you with a thing called a Ken Ken. So let me just show you how it works so you understand 
and then you'll be able to show others how that works. So we'll just put you back on the screen here for a moment. Now, once again, we've just made some counters here and they just have the numbers on, but there they are there anyway. So you've got the numbers, uh, one, two, three, and four. You could slide this sheet inside a plastic sleeve like you have in a file and use uh, something like a, I just use a dry erase pen. Uh, these ones I get from the UK, the show me pen, and then you can write and wipe, rub off. I'll show you what I mean later on, but any dry erase pen will do. Now, essentially, we need the same sort of language here. We need to understand there are things called rows. That's the first bit of language, and there are columns. Now, the first rule is this. You can't repeat a digit in a row, and you can't repeat a digit in a column. Now, the only digits we have, in this case, are one and two, we've got there, three and four, and they're the only numbers that you can use in a row. So you can't repeat any more in a row, so I could only use those digits there and likewise here. The final bit of language we need to understand is, I've colored these in, that's called, a, that's a, a cage, and inside that cage you can see the total is three. So in this case here, we know that one and two gives me three. But there's one extra little clue here, down the bottom, this one here is called a freebie because that cage is only one option, you can only put a one inside there. Well, now we've got a problem because can we see here, we can't have two ones in the same column. So here's a bit of learning. We can pick up the notion that one and two makes three, but so does two and one. So now we've got that. Now we could think about what else we could have in here. Well, we know that we've got, in this case here, a two and a one, we can see here. So there's only two more numbers I can use, and that's a, a three, and a four, and now, now notice this adds to 10. However, we've got a problem because across here, there's another free, 3D and it needs to have a three in it. And that violates the rule that I can't have more than one number in a row. So I need to do the same thing here, turn them around. So children are learning the turnaround facts. The fancy name for that is the commutative property of addition. And now I can see that I've got two and three is five, another four is nine, 10. So that column is 10 and I can start to complete the whole one. Now, just be aware we put some up on the web for you from Ken Ken number one right through to Ken Ken four and then some other variations. Uh, I need to be give you a cautionary tale. This can be quite addictive because you can get Ken Ken apps and get all sorts of things here. And just to let you know, it took me 11 minutes to do Ken Ken number four. So having some things to move around is pretty helpful. So we think a little puzzle like Ken Ken, as I said, you can do it with three by three, so a smaller one, or you can go to nine by nine, is a nice little uh, thinking puzzle. It practices uh, some of your basic number facts. And look, the reality is at home, you're not gonna be able to teach deep concepts uh, because that's the job of the teacher. But ultimately at home, what we need to do is keep the practice going. Um, it's not gonna be easy because we need to develop some routine. We need to get into that sort of routine. And so if we can have some puzzles that children really like to do, um, that's fine. Now, we can work together with them. So, so far what we've done is just played a game or two and done a puzzle or two. Um, we just wanna look at a couple of other ideas and I'll, I'll make uh, just make a few comments about that. So let me give you an example, okay? And I'll just use a, a board to illustrate this. I'm just gonna use a hundreds board. Now we put one up on the web for you anyway, but I'll just show you what we're gonna do with it now. Okay, so we've just put up a, a number board and uh, it, you'll notice there that it's got the numbers that go from one to 120. Uh, the reason I like to go beyond 100 is um, many children often when they're counting will go 109 and then go 200. So if you're listening or watching um, your ch ch uh, children count at home, um, then basically just make sure they go beyond 100 to look at that. I like the 100 board because it gives me lots of options to do. So let's just have a look at a couple. And um, as I say, in the coming weeks or so, we're gonna put up a few different puzzles and things to do with the 100 board. And I'll show you just one example. So I'm just gonna put some counters on that 100 board, the same counters we've been using. So I'm recycling and reusing the same ones. But just watch as I do this. Now, it's up to you uh, which one. I'm gonna put them on the four corners of a square. In fact, I might put yellow so it's a bit easier to see. So you can see we've got 24 there. And then I'm gonna put say 27. 
So we're going to make that one there and I'll grab two more yellow counters. And basically what I'm doing is putting the four corners of a square. It doesn't have to be a square, it could be a rectangle. Now let's have a look here now. Here's a little example where I think it's a nice sort of puzzle idea that's happening here, but it develops a bit of practice. So if you think about it, there's the four corners of our hundreds board. And if I add 24 and 57, uh, and I get that one, so that's the one that's going to be uh, 81. But if I look at this one, 54 and 27, uh, that's also 81. So now the question comes to my mind, well, does that always happen? Now, if I had younger children, I'd be using smaller numbers. So let's go down to something like here, the two, and let's go to 22, and we'll go to four, and I'm going to go to 24, and let's see if the same thing happens there. So let's have a look. So I've got uh, four and 22, that's 26, and two and 24 is also 26. Well, let me just extend it out a bit. Let's make a rectangle. If you look here, two and 25 is 27. 5 and 22 is 27. Wow, I wonder if that works all the time. Let me do one more. Let's go down. So if we've got older children, we could be down right down here into this section of the grid. So basically, you can take the same idea and depending on where you are on the grid, you can make the questions simpler or harder. And that's why I like some pretty simple tools. And as I said, we've made, uh, we put a grid up for you to download. Obviously, it's nice having the transparent counters. It makes it a bit easier. But essentially, um, uh, you could do that with the buttons as well, the same sort of idea that sits there. So essentially, we're trying to take a basic resource and do a pile of things with it because we appreciate you're going to be a bit limited in what you can do. Let's just take, for example, uh, multiplication tables. And there's lots of ways to teach those tables, but one is to look for patterns. So once again, I'd like to take the same board and just have a look at a few patterns. And we'll just take one table fact, the nine times table, and I'll show you exactly what it looks like on the board. So if it's like to just have another look at the board, I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so once again, we take the same board, but this time we're going to look at the multiples of nine. And you'll start to notice as, as we cover them, uh, we see a pattern forming. Now, actually mathematics, one of the explanations or definitions is it's the science of pattern. And we want to look and see whether that pattern continues. And that's another reason I like to go uh, beyond 100 because you can see that we're going to get a double pattern. Now, I don't have enough yellow counters, but as you see, as I add them on, uh, we'll put some green ones on, and you'll start to see how this pattern then develops. And then we're going to look for patterns within patterns. So if you have a look here, we've got 81, then we start 90. And so straight away, it's quite visual. And that's what I quite like because you know, for some children, the visual is a big deal. So that's why I like to have this sort of material. So sitting here, we can see there's a lovely pattern. And then the multiples of nine, the nine times table, we could be skip counting by nine. There's a lot of different language we could use. But let's have a look at two patterns that sit in here. One is, if you're having trouble learning the nine times table, then most children don't have much trouble learning the tens. So if you think about it, one, one lot of nine is the same as one lot of 10 take one. Two nines is the same as two tens take two. Three nines are the same as three tens take three. Four nines are the same as four tens take four. And you start to see that pattern form. That's one pattern. Another pattern is, it basically links to the divisibility rule. How do you know if something's divisible by nine? Well, if you think here, nine's obvious. One and eight is nine. So if I add the digits, the digit pattern gives me nine. Two and seven, also nine. Three and six is nine. I wonder if this pattern continues. Let's go over to the 90 and the 99. Well, nine and zero is nine. Nine and nine's 18. But if you add the one and the eight, you get back to nine. If you look here, right down to 117, uh, one and one is two and another seven is nine. And so that same pattern exists. So even just some of this pattern forming uh, notion is a pretty big deal uh, for children. So um, I just want to summarize a little bit here. Um, I appreciate that obviously children will need to do some worksheets and things of that nature uh, because you know, they're going to need to do some work that's of that sort of notion. What I'm trying to do is give them a little bit of variety uh, so that they don't get too bored, uh, that there's repeatable ideas that are happening here. And so far, all we've used is very simple material, hopefully that is sitting around, around your house. So 
I'll give you one little idea. Uh, maybe you can uh, take the dice from your Monopoly set or you once again could use the spinner. So I'll just give you one more idea that you can do with your dice. That might be there and then uh, we'll probably have to wrap up in a minute or two. But I just wanted to give you this, how we could play this sort of thing. Now, if you look here, I've got two different dice and I just need to make a little distinction here. Uh, I'm not sure what you might have at home. The dot dice is ideal for young children. So uh, my granddaughter has uh, just turned five. Uh, for the last three months, she's been telling me she's turning five. Uh, so, you know, little kids are like, but anyway, in here, this pattern here, I would expect her to be able to see five, not count five. So essentially that's called subitizing or subitizing. And that's a pretty important thing that you can do. So we don't want to encourage dot counting. If I'd toss the four, then I'd want to be able to say four fairly quickly. Uh, and that's about appropriate for her, her year level. Later on, of course, we could substitute number dots. But let me give you a really simple game, okay? And it's pretty simple here. We're gonna roll the dice, and we'll keep a record. So I've got a five, and you keep rolling until you've got one of each number. So now I've got a six, and you keep rolling again, and I've got a three. You keep rolling till you've got at least one of each number, and you get a total. Now, typically, that's gonna take you about 14 rolls, to get a total because some numbers will come up again. So if I roll again, roll again, see the four came up twice at that point there. So basically it's roughly on average 14 to 15 rolls and you get a total. I guarantee the total won't be the same every time. So that's a pretty simple one. We also play one other game called poison that children really love and you choose a poison number. So for my case, that's called the poison number six. And essentially, you keep rolling and you keep rolling and you keep rolling, keep adding to your total, keep accumulating a running total. However, if the poison number comes up, you lose all your points for that round. So sometimes you say, oh, you're being greedy, going too much. So let me give you an example. I'll roll now if you have a bit of a look. Okay, well, I'll roll to six, so I'm done straight away. Let's imagine that didn't happen. Okay, I roll to three. I roll to one. So I'm on four points right now. I then roll to three, so I'm on seven points now. I roll to two, so I'm on nine points. Now, I'm going to rest at that point. I'll keep my nine points. Because if after that point I roll and I roll a six, I would bust or that's my poison number. Now another player has a shot and they roll and they got a five and they got a one, so they're on six. And they're on another one, seven. But if they kept rolling and then they rolled, here we go, rolled a six, they would bust, they'd be on zero. So the first player would keep their points, the second player will lose all of their points. Now I guess my time's pretty well run up, so I better uh, hand back to Heather. She's gonna collect some questions and that from you. So uh, thanks for hosting this Heather for us, appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Paul Swan. There's some amazing tips and tricks for all homeschoolers. I saw there's a lot of teachers here asking for symmetry, geometry, numeracy, lots of pace value. So I think your time is going to, we're going to definitely have you on again. That would be amazing. I just want to say thank you for myself. You know, there's a lot of tips I can do with my own children there. I really appreciate it. I just want to let everyone know, I put an email up there. If they want questions, can they please send them in to heather at edxeducation.com. Also, we'll have the recording available um, on the EDX Education and the Dr. Paul Swan YouTube channel. So we can send that out. And we just wanted to, we want to say a really big thank you to Dr. Paul Swan and his team for taking the time today to be in conversation with EDX Education. And head over, if you have a chance, head over to drpaulswan.com.au to view all of his homeschooling resources. Um, he's updating videos and ideas each week. He's got a lot of amazing content. And we look forward to um, hearing from you all again. If you've got any suggestions for topics, please send them through. Okay, thank you very much for everyone attending. Thank you, Paul. Right.